all these things that you think about adventuring, I really think about as engineering problems. You know, they're they're fun, they're interesting, they have lots of different things. I mean, skydiving it was the same way. I actually, you know, I was 18 years old. A friend of mine convinced me to go skydiving. I I had no interest in skydiving, but when he said it involves airplanes and it involves you know parachutes and you know I had seen it on television and things like that, it's like sure, yeah. I said I said yes. You know, it's like. It's kind of a funny thing. Somebody will come to you with some idea, which is kind of crazy, you know, like outside of your norm. And the inclination I think most people have is to say, uh, uh, no, no, that's just not me. Uh, but, you know, you'll find in moments, you know, that saying yes to those things, um, moving yourself outside your comfort zone a little bit and uh, trying new things could have dramatic impacts later in your life. And that's what happened to me. My, you know, my friend from childhood, David Lane. Uh, he asked me, you know, if I could go skydiving with him the day he turned 18. Uh, I was six months older. So uh, anyway, so I, I did. I had only I had an intention of doing it exactly once, but I, I actually really enjoyed it. And uh, and uh, he really enjoyed it. And he twisted my arm to come back a second, and third time. And uh, and uh, I've been skydiving ever since. So, you know, there's there's small things. But, you know, for me, I, I always love the engineering side, you know, and uh, and I love that, you know, I love math, I love science, I love physics, you know, all of these things just just kind of combine and all of these, you know, it, it allows you to think about things in a different way. And uh, so I really enjoy that. So, so that's that's how skydiving started. Rock climbing. I went on a trip with some rock climbers and they started showing me all the tricks and uh, and I uh, love being outdoors. So, you know, that started from a Boy Scout. You know, I started in Boy Scouts and we used to go every summer for a week. So uh, I don't know, it just uh, it just keeps keeps rolling flying I always wanted to fly you know I finally got a chance to learn to fly at some point you know it's like 35 years ago or something like that to me it was like the most wonderful thing so just trying new things and um and uh you know really going deep in I'm learning about it even if you can't do it even if you can't afford to fly I mean I I studied flying for 20 years actually almost 30 years before I ever set foot in a small airplane so uh, anyway so always fun to learn that is really cool. And speaking of learning, you're very active in the STEM community. And um, one of the kids wants to know, what, what is it like trusting in science so much that you, was it 135,000 feet that you would float up that high and skydive pretty much from space, really pretty much? What is it like trusting in science that much? Like how, how much math went into that? Oh, it's a tremendous amount of math. Every single element of it had both math and science and physics. And I mean, uh, um, I mean, you think it's like a one event, you know, that you go up there and you try it out. And it was what started out is one idea. I mean, the idea was scuba diving in the stratosphere, right? You know, why build a capsule, all this kind of stuff. There's lots of problems with capsules and, and why they're, they tend to, you think they're going to make you safer. But you know, in my opinion, they're actually more complicated and they, they, they have a lot of failure modes that are, uh, that you don't think about so much. So for me, it was like, well, let's just do scuba diving. Let's, let's strap a couple tanks on and a, on a spacesuit and just go up. And, you know, that was the idea, but, you know, of course it took, you know, three years after that idea, um, uh, to, uh, to really perfect it in a way that it'll really work. But by that time we had done a lot of tests. I mean, I had been in that spacesuit for like 150 hours. I knew how durable it was. Uh, you know, we had, uh, we had tested all the skydiving configurations, you know, we had, we'd done ground tests, we'd done airplane tests, you know, um, and each of those just raised the bar a little bit um, from where it was before. So I wouldn't recommend just buying a spacesuit and going up, but, you know, we probably did 250 tests, you know, some manned, some unmanned um, tests as we started to learn about the various characteristics and, and redesign, you know, when something didn't work, you know, we, uh, there's one moment we had a really bad test, you know, uh, it's like, it wasn't just one thing it didn't work like three things didn't work um and uh and so you know once you do that you know you have to step back and you say well what could we do you know that's radically different and so we did we you know we spent a year and we totally redesigned the system and made it a lot safer and uh uh you know addressed all the issues and things like that so so for me it's not just the you know just writing down a bunch of equations and hope you get it right you know it's you write about a bunch of equations you work hard you hire a really good team, you know, that really understands the basics and they work really closely with you the whole time. Um, you check each other's work, you know, you don't just, you know, just assume. And then if you say this is going to work, that the auction is going to last this long, 
you know, you experiment with it. Let's let's try it on the ground and you know see how long it lasts there, and let's try it at you know higher altitudes and see how long it lasts there. Um, so it's it's an iterative process um, where you believe you you do the science, but then you you uh, you know check it, you know through real world observations. I think that that cycle is super important. Um, don't just believe everything you read, you know. Uh, if, you know, there's a story of my dad, I, my dad, it was always big on, you know, not believing everything you should read. And I remember there was a column in a newspaper and somebody was trying to say whether, you know, you, when you take a shower, do you use more water in a shower or a bath? And my dad was just hilariously laughing at this. What do you mean you use more water in a shower or bath? You know, why are you asking some columnist in a newspaper about that? Just, you know, go in, plug up the tub, you know take a shower and then see if the amount of water in the bath is more or less than what you would use for a bath. And then, you know, for yourself, you know, you don't have to ask an expert. You can actually figure out that, that question. Um, and for most people, you know, showers use less water, but, uh, uh, for some people, I'm sure that take, you know, half hour showers, you know, the tub would run over. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, that's the whole point, you know, try to learn stuff. You know, I mean, if you look at my, uh, stratospheric thing, you know, the cool part, I mean, it was, it was fun uh, seeing the darkness of space and the curvature of the earth. Uh, don't get me wrong. That was super fun. Uh, but I also got to work with super smart people, balloon people and aeromedicine people and, you know, environmental people and all these different things combined in a way that uh, I wouldn't have got to learn it uh, or meet those people for that matter uh, without stretching out of my comfort zone a bit. So anyway, it was fun. Is it okay if some of the students ask you some questions? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, we have Leo Leo in uh, France. Leo, you had a really good question. Um, you should be able to unmute and ask. Yes, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay, yeah. wonderful. I would like to ask you, so from what I know that is that you went to university in Florida, mm -hmm. correct? Uh, university of Central Florida. Yes. And I was wondering how you transitioned from going to university and graduating into working with startups in Silicon Valley in California. Oh, that's a great question. Really, really good question. Yeah, I was in I was in Florida, uh, um, a university called University of Central Florida. At, at the time, it was called Florida Technological University. Um, and uh, what what happened was I uh, I wrote a paper. Uh, it was part of my master's thesis, um, and it got accepted to a really, really major conference, um, probably the largest design automation conference in the world at the time. Uh, and it was in Las Vegas. So I you know, I'd never, I, I don't think I'd been on a plane very many times. I've certainly never been to a Caesar's Palace, and, which is this giant, beautiful hotel in uh, Las Vegas. And I'm, I'm standing in line uh, uh, to get my hotel room. And the, the people, two people were behind me. I uh, started a, up a conversation with them, or they started it up with me, I think. They probably saw how nervous I was. And uh, so anyway, it turns out they were from Stanford and they had they were doing work in the same area, obviously, that I was because it was a conference in that area. And I had actually used their software before. Uh, and so we struck up a conversation and we spent a lot of time together at the conference. And uh, and uh, and I, they went to my came to my talk and I went to their talks and uh, it was great. And um, we really hit it off. We went to um, Hoover Dam together uh, and took the tour, which was super fun because they're super smart and uh, people. And uh, anyway, I get back to uh, get, get back to school and I get an email message from one of them saying, hey, do you want to come out to Stanford and do some research with our research group? And it was like I talked to my advisor. I said, hey, you know, I just got this invitation. He said, sure, go right ahead. That would be great for you. It'd be good for us in the program too to learn more about what's going on over there. So so I flew out there and I got an apartment uh, and uh, actually stayed in somebody's house uh, uh, in a room in, in their house and uh, and stayed there for almost a year, and I I met them, and and when I left, they told me they were about to start a company, and uh, and when I finished my PhD, you know, if I could come back, they would they would love to hire me, um, which is very very flattering. And so it took me about a year to finish up my PhD, maybe a little more, and uh, and by that time they started their company, and so I came and joined their company, and was there for two years. Left and uh, went to a research lab, Digital Equipment Corporation, which got bought by Compaq, which got bought by uh, um, by, uh, HP. And then I left to go to Google and, uh, and, uh, that was, <laughs> that's the last job other than this, you know, little CEO autonomous, you know, undersea exploration company. Um, but, uh, but anyway, so, so it was really, I mean, I, you know, from being a kid in Florida, hardly ever leaving the state to, 
you know, coming out to Silicon Valley and being introduced to all these wonderful people and, uh, and learning, um, you know, a lot about, you know, how things get done here. Uh, you know, it was, it was super helpful, but, uh, anyway, it just goes back to the theme that your paths are not, you know, somebody once told me, you know, uh, about career paths, you know, they said, there's this beautiful view. On, um, it's a woman, uh, Nora Denzel. She's the, she's the one that mentioned it to me. She said, a lot of people think about career paths and she goes, I've never found it to be a path. She said, she goes, paths are these beautiful, you know, paved things that go like this, you know, you know, gardens on each side and stuff like that. She goes, that's not it. She goes, she goes, it's not a career path. It's an obstacle course. You know, there's things you have to jump over, climb over, dig under, people knock you off. The weather gets horrible. You know, it's like, uh, it's like, that's what, uh, that's what careers are really like. So don't, don't let people fool you because a lot of people, when they think about a path, as soon as they hit an obstacle, they go, Oh my gosh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, but uh, if you think about it as an obstacle course, you say, oh, yeah, of course, this giant pit full of water is in front of me. You know, I got to I got to figure out how to deal with this pit of water. Should I should I swim it? Should I, you know, like jump it? Should I pole vault it? Should I go around it? I mean, that's what life's really like. There's uh, there's a lot of setbacks along the way. So uh, we have a, a couple more questions. Sorry, we don't want to keep keep you too much because I know that you probably have some really, really precious time. Um, but we have Maria in, in Spain and she had a pretty good question for you. Maria, you had a question about his engineering uh, background. Who got you, hey sir, who got you into engineering? So my, that's a great question. My dad was a mechanical engineer. He worked for Mar Marietta. He actually worked on some parts of the space shuttle and, uh, and a bunch of other projects. So, uh, so I learned, you know, from him about, I mean, he was always bringing home things and learning about it. We did a lot of experiments at home and stuff like that. So he, he was the one that got me into uh, engineering and mechanical engineering. But it's funny because when I went to school, I was on a debate scholarship for a, for a short period of time and then transferred into to mechanical engineering. And I wasn't doing very well in mechanical engineering. I just, it wasn't for me. I, it was like, uh, I, you know, I, I, the courses were really hard. I, I did okay until I got to thermodynamics and thermodynamics is super hard. It was a super hard question. And so, uh, so, uh, but the same time I took thermodynamics, I also took this course in computer programming, uh, a, a computer language called Fortran. And I loved the computer programming. I could spend all day and all night writing programs for computers and thermodynamics. I was just barely getting by studying as hard as I could. And, uh, and so I switched majors at that time. I went into computers rather than mechanical engineering. And I went, I went to, uh, to the co-op because I had a co-op set up this, you know, you can work over the summer and, come, and get work experience and come back. And I went to him because he had a mechanical engineering co-op set up for me. And, and I said, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I, I'm going to switch majors. Do you have anything in computer science? Do you have any jobs, internships, co-op opportunities in computer science? And he, he put his arm around me and said, you know, Alan, I'm sorry to tell you, there just aren't any jobs in computer science. <laughs> and I said, oh, well, I, I love it so much. I'm going to do it anyway, even if there are no jobs in it. And uh, um, and so I switched over. But here's the strange part. So I spent my whole career in computer science, which I love. And it's it's a it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. But then all these projects that I'm doing, actually, the mechanical engineering has come back to me, you know, all the time. You know, it's like. Every project I'm on, you know, on the hardware side, have all this really cool mechanical engineering. So now I'm coming back into mechanical engineering from, you know, the point of view of I really want to be able to do this, you know, like I want to build something that can go to the bottom of the ocean and deal with 16,000 psi pressure, you know, um, for, for you metric people, 103 megapascals of pressure, enormous amount of pressure down there. And boy, I'd, I'd love to go back and understand the mechanical engineering more because it would really help me right now. Yeah, I feel like you would be in a special category as someone who has gone so high and now you're going so low. That is a very small club you're probably in. Um, well, it's, it's so. funny. There are people that have gone to the highest and the bottom, but the undersea stuff is all autonomous. I mean, it, uh, the, the, the thing goes, the, the vehicle goes down there, not me. My, my wife would never let me go down the bottom of the ocean, you know, especially in a vehicle that I design. You know, maybe if I... I have done submersibles before. I've been down to, to 2,000 meters before, which was, which was really fun and things like that. But uh, to efficiently, I mean, my, my view is you really want to efficiently explore the oceans. And uh, to do that, you, a single vehicle with a single person isn't going to be, um, 
Um, it's not a way to understand the oceans to the depth that I think. I mean, the joke is we know more about the surface of Mars than we do our own oceans, which is 70 percent of the landmass of the country and uh, uh, of the planet. And, you know, for me, it's like, uh, boy, that's it used to just make me laugh about that, you know. Uh, but now lately, it's kind of making me angry. It's like uh, it's not that I don't believe in Mars explorations. I, I love those guys. JPL is a wonderful thing. I mean, you guys saw the moon landing. Uh, I mean, the Mars landing. It was like spectacular. It was beautiful. Uh, but I do feel like we're we've underinvested in understanding our ocean. So, you know, my view is we should be able to build, you know, cheap vehicles, you know, maybe ten thousand dollars each or something like that and build thousands of them, honestly, to spend a lot of time in the ocean understanding what it is and the uh, so that's kind of what we're working on now. So I'll I'll uh, I'll read this for because we've actually got this question from a it's it's pretty unique because it's the same question from students in different parts of the world, both in Las Vegas as well as in Europe. But they want to know what was it like free falling? How long did you free fall, and did you spin around really fast when you were free falling? Uh, yeah. So um, so. One of the things I, people may remember, uh, Felix Baumgartner and the uh, Red Bull attempt, and uh, Felix didn't use a drogue chute. He declined the drogue chute because he wanted to make sure he went over Mach 1. He would have gone over Mach 1 anyway, but uh, but he declined to use that. And uh, as a result, when he came out, he actually went into an inverted flat spin. He was actually um, upside down, you know, spinning in a flat spin. And flat spins are super dangerous because if you uh, – you get into a flat spin, um, what happens is the faster you spin, the more centrifugal force that you have, and it forces the blood up toward your head and down toward your feet. Now, down toward your feet doesn't really matter so much, but the forcing blood up to your head causes an increase in pressure of that blood inside your blood vessels. And if that pressure gets high enough from that spin, they explode, and, and you can have strokes and other things. So it's very, very dangerous to spin. And he was in a flat spin. He almost passed out. It came very close to passing out. And then he righted the flat spin, and everything went, went went fine. But when we saw that, we said, you know, we're not we're not gonna we're gonna design a system that's spin proof or at least spin resistant. So I didn't have to worry about spins, you know. And I didn't have to worry about being not face to the earth. We had designed this beautiful, elegant system um, that would allow me to uh, uh, to not have to worry about flat spins. Uh, but the jump itself was 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 beautiful. I mean, we went up. We had done three, um, two previous jumps, one at 55,000, one at 105,000. We got up to 135,000. The only thing that was really di- going to be different is the air is super thin. I mean, 99, you're above 99.8 percent. The views are a lot better. You know, it's 135,000 feet. The darkness of space is everywhere. It's beautiful. Courage of the arts is beautiful. Um, but the only thing is, you're going to go a lot faster. You're going to go to to uh, Mach 1. Point, in my case, 1.22. Whereas the previous test was uh, did never exceeded uh, Mach one, and so so then what happens is we are set up so that I do a flat release so that you know and the idea is you were going to do a release that didn't have you turning or spinning or anything like that, uh, but because of the the the, the um, strange I can go into mechanical engineering but there's just a slight asymmetry, so when I release it's zero g I mean there it literally is zero g because you're falling at exactly the rate of gravity. So the gravity in relation to you is zero. So you're just floating. I mean, it, you know, it's, uh, and, and I, in my case, I, I did this little backflip and then, which was, you know, you think backflips are, you know, kind of bad, you know, you kind of get scared because you look up, but, but for me, it was kind of nice because I got to see the balloon. I'd never seen the balloon falling away from a balloon before. And the balloon I mean, you think these balloons are small and, and on the ground they're, they're kind of small, but when they go up, they expand and you can put any football stadium, you know, I mean, football meaning soccer or fo- football meaning football, you know, American football. You put any of those stadiums, a hundred thousand people, you put it inside that balloon. That balloon is giant, you know? And, uh, and so when you, when I fell backwards, uh, I could see the thing, this giant balloon and I could see myself receding away from it and it getting smaller and smaller, but total quiet silence, totally silence. The only, only thing you hear is your own breathing, you know, and uh, and then uh, about it stays that way for like 50 seconds or something like that, where it's total silence. And then and you have no feeling of speed at, at all. You, you do not feel like you're, spe- you're going fast or slow. There's no noise. You can't calibrate how fast you're going. 
And then all of a sudden you start to hear sound. And when you hear sound, that means you're slowing down. You're starting to hit the Earth's atmosphere um, because of your speed and because of how many, uh, what the pressure is against it, it starts to slow you down. And, uh, and then you just continually slow down the entire way uh, until you get down to, um, you know, opening altitude, which is 10,000 feet above the ground. So the, the descent took four minutes and 27 seconds, um, which goes by pretty quickly. Although I must say it's kind of funny because I, you know, there's only a few people in the world. I went to a skydiving conference one time and, uh, and uh, they're the only people that have saw the entire four minute and 27 seconds of descent. And, uh, and they loved it, obviously. But four minutes and 27 seconds is a long time, you know. If I played that video for you, you guys would be yawning. Uh, you know, it's uh, a long time, but uh, but it's kind of cool to go faster than uh, in the speed of sound. There's no, you have no indication that you crossed the speed of sound. There's no no difference in hearing or anything. Uh, but what's cool is the people on the ground actually heard a sonic boom. So I made a sonic boom, which uh, I, I don't think there's too many people that have made sonic booms. You know, me and Felix and uh just using their body not not using a jet so anyway that was cool i think that that's in, another thing that's absolutely incredible that you can check off that uh only person to have done that <laughs> well, uh, felix, right off the list felix, felix has been is, felix i mean uh, i like felix and i love that program it was they did an amazing job but he actually went faster than me because he didn't have a drug he went from lower altitude but uh but he actually went a little faster so he's like 1.25 muck I'm Mach, Mach 1.22 and he's Mach 1.27. So I've got the altitude record, but he's got the speed record, which, which seems totally fair. Yeah, I, th I think in, in either case, that's just absolutely incredible. Um, well, I don't want to uh, take any more of your time, but before we let you go, is there any kind of advice you would give to these kids as they go off into the world and kind of figure out what they want to do in life, whether it's working in STEM, working um, in, you know, uh, startups, whatever it may be, what kind of advice would you have for these kids as they figure out what they want to do with their lives? Yeah, I think, you know, my, my advice, I mean, uh, is uh, figure out who you want to work with, figure out the things that you're interested in and who you want to work with. And uh, I think who you want to work with is more important a lot of times because, you know, you, uh, you know, you get this, grand, you know, idea of, you know, going to do, I don't know, go to Mars or something like that, which is a great idea. You know, I mean, uh, you know, in your lifetime, you may actually get that opportunity to buy a ticket to Mars. Uh, I don't think my lifetime is going to be long enough for that unless they solve the aging problem, which, uh, which I, there are a lot of people working on, honestly, it's, uh, and they're making a lot of progress. But, you know, for me, figure out who you want to work with and figure out what you want to do. Uh, don't define it really narrowly. I mean, uh, I think a lot of people, you know, pick one thing, you know, and they say, oh, I want to be a doctor or something. And so and and that's fine for a lot of people. That's fine. But um, and then they just focus on that. But I think the cool thing in life is that, uh, you know, for me, I wanted to focus on mechanical engineering. And then I realized that wasn't where, you know, I was that was what I was good at. You know, it's one thing to focus on something that um, you love. Uh, but you also focus on something that you love at you're good at, you know, like, I mean, I might love to be a, you know, concert pianist or something, but I have no musical talent at all. I, I might want to be an opera singer, but believe me, you do not want to hear me sing. Um, so focus on something that you're good at and then focus on something that other people will appreciate. Um, and uh, and if you do that and open yourself up to to way wider sets of possibilities, you know, and. Uh, and then explore as you go along. Uh, don't be so rigid. I, I, you know, I have a, I have a, 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 you know, management philosophy after managing at Google. And, you know, I, I think I had managed 17,000 people or something like that in my organization at Google. And, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I came away thinking is it's not about planning. You know, some people think they can plan their way out of things like, hey, if I just spend another three months planning or another year planning, then I won't get any surprises and and things will go faster because I planned more and and in the end. And uh, my view is that's that's totally false. You know, you can plan. Don't don't forget planning. Do that. But doing is where you learn and planning can't solve all the problems that you're going to come up with. So so in your career, you know, don't spend all your time planning for a single outcome. That's, you know, 
because there's not going to be one outcome um, and there's not going to be one setback that's going to knock you off. You know, plan and say, wow, I, I really I'm interested in these 20 things, you know, and uh, and I'm going to explore a lot of different options. And even if I start down one path, I want to be flexible enough to be able to take care of whatever opportunity comes with me. I mean, being in line at, you know, the design automation conference, you know, and seeing meeting these two guys that changed my life. That changed where I went, you know, who I interacted with. It changed where I lived. It changed, you know, who I associated with. It changed what companies I got to work with. I mean, everything was related to that one moment in time. And uh, there's going to be a moment in time like that for you. And, uh, and you know, open yourself up to these, you know, amazing serendipitous things that are going to happen to you. And, and by the way, if you ask any adult, you know, say, name one moment in your life where something happened in that moment that actually made a tremendous change in where you were headed and where you were going, every single one of them will have that moment. Maybe it's the moment they met their, you know, wife or husband, um, uh, or, you know, maybe it's a moment where they learned something new and it saved their life or whatever, but uh, we all have those moments. So open yourself up to them. It's the funnest thing to be, uh, be surprised about what you like and what you're interested in and what you want to do. So anyway, that's my advice.